Um, but let me share that uh, we're doing this in honor of Yom Ha'atzma'ut, which was officially yesterday, but the JCC in Manhattan is having programs um, through Sunday, I believe. And um, so there are more programs to come. Please uh, check our daily listings of many JCC programs, but for Yom Ha'atzma'ut programs specifically. We're also going to be adding many more film programs coming up in a few days. We're going to um, send out a blast about our May films, and we hope to have something almost weekly. And then in June, we're going to be having our Israel Film Center Festival, which is um, going to highlight some of the um, best new Israeli films um, in a kind of more mainstream way, um, different from our other Israel Film Festival, which we're going to run hopefully in December, maybe in person. We'll all get together. Um, I'm also going to take this opportunity, of course, to share on a much more serious note that um, we know this is a challenging time, um, and we hope you are all well and that your family members are well, and um, we see this as really as an opportunity to bring our community together and um, kind of have a little bit of a sense of togetherness in these tough times. Um, I'm going to use this moment. Um, we are actually waiting for also, I'm not just stalling. Um, I'm, I'm sharing important information, but I'm also hoping that uh, Edgar is still, um, who has confirmed, will yeah, be joining he's us. Way. He's on his way. Um, yeah. but in the meantime, I'm going to take this opportunity to introduce the filmmakers who you've kind of met through the film a little bit. By the way, raise your hand if you've seen the film already. If you haven't seen the film yet, um, it, the link is available till 7 p.m., so right after the screening. And it's not one of those films that I think have too many spoilers. It actually might even be interesting after this conversation to rewatch or to watch the film. So, um, so, you have, so you can actually watch the film after this conversation as well. And um, we're excited to have here um, not just um, Edgar Carrot, who will be joining in a moment, but also Stefan Kass, the director. Stefan, you can give a wave and say hi. Hi. And Rutger Lenn. You see, I think we see Rutger, who is uh, also a director, or sometimes gets credited as co-writer. Um, I don't know how you officially do it. IMDb put you that way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> uh, thank you both for being with us and for this uh, really lovely film. Um, I'm, I'm kind of waiting, do we think uh, Edgar's on yet? Have we seen him? Yeah, maybe you should sometimes check the waiting room. I'm not sure how this works, but... <laughs> but I'll, I'll start with you guys and Edgar will, will jump in. I'm sure he'll know. But, um, but let me start just with a question for the two of you. I've seen a lot, I want to say, and I'm going to say a lot about the film and what I liked about the film once Edgar's here too, to hear all the accolades, because uh, I think you did, you did a really great job and it was a great way of capturing the spirit of the stories too. Um, maybe you could give us the background of how this started for you beyond what we already saw in the film, um, and, but really how you created this very creative, and I'd say um, almost postmodern program and, and film as far as all the different aspects uh, that went into it. Did you start with this? How, how did the script come into all of this? Tell us a little bit about how this was made, the, that process. Yeah, um, shall I uh, begin, Rutger, and uh, you take over when yeah. you disagree? <laughs> <laughs> I always disagree, yeah. <laughs> so actually, uh, uh, Rutger and me, we know each other for a long time already. Uh, uh, we know each other from, uh, from uh, high school. Uh, and there, um, at a sudden moment, I, 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 was in a, I was in a bookshop and I saw, a, um, uh, I saw a book with a nice cover. I bought it. It uh, was the uh, it was a, a book by uh, Edgar Carrot, and uh, the day after I told one of these stories to uh, to Rutger, and uh, it was the story Fetso, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so from that moment, on, yeah. So from that moment, the, the, yeah, the one that the film starts with. So from that moment on, uh, I think we both became uh, uh, Carrot fans. And uh, 10 years later, I, I, I became a filmmaker and Rutger was a journalist, is still a journalist and writer. And, uh, and um, we had a plan to, uh, to uh, make a short fiction film of, 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 of that. So, ah, there he is. <laughs> Welcome. 
Yeah, yeah, we are. We're, we're just talking about how the film was uh, was conceived and started. Um, we figured we didn't. Need, we, this is from before you got involved, so we didn't need you for that. But thank you for being here with us. Thank you, thank you, Edgar, for being so late. <laughs> I, I forgot. <laughs> I was watching Ozark, and then Stefan called me. He said, "Oh my God, oh, okay. how, many, how many emails did I send you?" <laughs> you know, it's all these kind of like you know Zoom days that you you in your slippers and your pajamas, and you kind of forget everything. You know. Yeah. You have this kind of uh, shaving and getting in the car. <laughs> I have to get used to it, you know. I'm no dog, you know. It's difficult to get you used to it. How is the new season of Ozark? How is Ozark? Oh, we're still in season two. I'm right. way back. Okay. Edgar, we're having some trouble seeing you, so I don't, hearing you. Sorry, hearing you. So I don't know ah, if you the phone is in your uh, best uh, position. Uh, yes, I. You want me? I can, I can bring my my son's gamer headphones, and then uh, I look like a kind of a spaceship pilot, and uh, you hear me better. You want me? You want me to get them? Yeah, 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 yeah. Good. Just for that. <laughs> so, uh, so, so, okay. So, from from this idea to make a, a short fiction film, uh, the idea became bigger. We also thought, oh, why not make a documentary with his uh, stories in it? It could be a short documentary, and after that became a longer documentary, and so it grew. It totally organically grew into this. Uh, into this, what it is now. Maybe uh, you want to add something, uh, Rutger? No, it sounds perfect. <laughs> no, we, we were we were looking like the whole time for a way to, oh. to show the whole persona. Hi, hey, can you hear me better? <laughs> yeah. Hey. <laughs> Just, just let us know when the plane lands, okay? <laughs> okay. You'll know. You'll know when it will land. <laughs> yeah. Um, Rutger, were you going to add anything? Yeah. So we were looking for a way to show uh, the the his whole mind of this wonderful, brilliant man who is uh, uh, <laughs> such a genius, and. Uh, uh, and, 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 you know, to, to find a way to, uh, you know, do right by all his sides. So uh, uh, his fiction stories, but also his life story, which is just, just as crazy. Uh, so then Stefan thought of this way of showing his uh, anecdotes in reenactments. And that got us really excited. And uh, later on, we added the animations, which uh, also had to be, uh, yeah, a little bit raw, like Edgar's stories are. And uh, it came together really well, I think. So, so that's what I was going to share very briefly about uh, what I like about this thing. One of the things I really like about this film is that um, it really captures, the t in my mind, the tone of Edgar's stories. And um, in, I've seen, I don't know if all, but many, many films that have been, um, have been adapted, adaptations of Edgar's stories. And um, this one, by having kind of Edgar in many ways being a part of it and being in many ways, many of them the storyteller, um, and the narrator being almost in first person actually is the best way, he's the best person to tell the story. Sure, you could hire like, you know, a big Hollywood actor to read the stories or tell the stories, but um, hearing it with his voice and with his interaction within it, I thought was really a brilliant move and, um, and kind of something also fresh, Edgar, I don't know if that's been done before. Is that really your first time acting in a movie? Uh, I didn't really acting it i think like i basically you know it was more on the level of doing what uh, rodgar and stefan had asked me to do you know i think acting is really kind of getting into a role and you know like the daniel d lewis thing you know starting to have the walk you know and with me just like you know stefan said now you go and shout on that guy and now you sit down and now you know so so i think this i can do i i don't i can't do hamlet but this i can do <laughs> But this this makes a difference uh, that uh, Edgar is uh, actually he he is he, he says he's not a he's not a good actor but he actually he kind of he kind of is uh, but it makes a difference to have someone who can uh, can really uh, you know he he was you you were on a on the Israeli uh, uh, Baywatch right yeah you yeah yeah I play I played the. 
a, a drug dealer that is after it is being uh, uh, exposed as an undercover uh, cop. Et voilà. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but you know, it was a little bit like you, you know, they say, go here, go there, look surprised. You know, it was very basic. You know, it's not Hamlet. <laughs> Don't tell anyone, but for many actors, that's really what it is. Go here, <laughs> go there. <laughs> smile, smile a little less. But, 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 but I want to say something that, that the idea for me in this movie is, I think, I think that uh, all the time when people want, uh, ask me, uh, asked to do, to do a documentary about me, I refused because there was something very kind of passive in it. You know, it's like your wildlife, you some kind of, I don't know, a, a, a monkey in the jungle and they put camera and they say, ha, ah, this is how he is in his habitat and stuff. But uh, with Rutger and Stefan, it, it, it felt like, let's do a movie together. Like, we don't know, we want to talk about things and maybe if you do this, it will work and maybe it won't work. So, it, so I felt really that I was uh, collaborating on something. I had no idea what that thing was because uh, there were the bosses, but I felt that we were trying to make something together. So it kind of gave a different vibe, you know. I think that, you know, I bet that when somebody makes a documentary on you, you want the truth to come out or you want to come out really nice, you know. And, and these are two things that I would be happy with. But I think that mostly... I had the feeling that we were trying to make kind of a, an interesting film, you know, a film that will be nice to watch. And, yeah. and how involved um, were you in the process as far as the editing side and, um, and approving anything? Or did you guys have free, full artistic freedom? Yeah, they, of course it was their movie. I, I think that in a couple of stages, they asked me things and I always gave them such long and the, uh, complicated and discomforting answers that I think that in some stage they, they thought maybe it wasn't such a good idea. But <laughs> the, in the bottom line, I think everything I said, they always listened, you know, many times they didn't agree with me, but they always listened and they, and again, you know, I think that, I think that the things that kind of uh, attracted me to the project from, from the first place was that uh, I really had a feeling that the, uh, that they were trying to do something that would be good. And that's, that was what interested them. You know, they didn't want to come out smart. They didn't want to have the right angles. They didn't want to protest against, I don't know, and for animal rights, you know, they just wanted to do something that would express something they felt, you know, and I kind of immediately identified with it. This is what I try to do all my life. Um, Rutger and Stefan, did you want to add to that as far as the process? Yeah, yeah I think what, 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 what oh. I found funny was, uh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> what I found funny was uh, the first reaction of Edgar uh, when he saw the film, I could relate to it because it's, it's always, it's weird to watch yourself back. So he said, like, it's, it's, it's like hearing your voice on an answering machine. You don't, you don't like watching yourself. So he, he never really said that he liked it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he said uh, after the first uh, viewing that uh, people uh, people saw the film and they, they laughed and they he said to us, uh, well, okay, so people seem to like it. <laughs> and he, I, I, yeah. Yeah, no, but, but, but I want to say, you know, it's really, uh, I th because I feel you're, you're my friends and I would never like say anything I don't mean. And I think that I really... I really like and appreciated the attempt because I didn't feel that the film was about me. I think that the film was trying to understand something about telling stories, you know? And I felt like, you know, that this was a very uh, interesting question that you posed. And it was just this guy in the main role, you know, the guy that was all the time on the screen that I, did, I felt wasn't that sharp, you know, and wasn't talking the way I would have said it, you know? Or like, you know, the, the way I would have said it if no, somebody wouldn't put a camera against my face, you know? So, so I really, it, I, I really, I like the movie. I just didn't like myself in it too much. <laughs> it's, it's tough. I, I find it even on these Zoom calls, sometimes we are, we're looking at ourselves so much that it's, uh, <laughs> so don't enjoy always looking at ourselves. It's a challenge. Um, Rutger, you wanted to add something? Well, I think, 
uh, throughout the movie, you feel that we're just having fun. Uh, and I'm glad you guys saw the long version, I think, uh, where we uh, visit Kobe uh, and, oh, and Kobe. Rudy, uh, Edgar's friends. And I think this atmosphere was very much the atmosphere that we had among each other, like sort of, sort of playfulness among, you know, just regular guys. And uh, for Edgar, it was very important that he could tell the stories when we did the reenactments to someone's face. And since I had a pretty vague role on set, I, I, I was the face a lot of the time. So I had to put my face next to the camera and just keep walking backwards. So he could, he could tell the story to, to someone. Uh, and I think that that <laughs> made it more natural. And you were a very good listener. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I want to jump into, I think, what is the main question of the film. And it was interesting. I was watching it for, I think, my second or maybe third time. Um, you start off with it. You start off when, when you guys are being interviewed by the, by the, um, the guy in uh, Ben-Gurion Airport, by the um, officer there. You put, you put in a little subtle hint to all of it. Um, you say to him, it's the truth. And he says to you, can you prove it? Um, which I think is kind of, if you need an exploring question of the film, it was like exploring the question of um, truth versus false within Edgar's stories. Um, but what's really interesting is that the film actually, and this is also one of the things I thought was brilliant about the film, the mm -hmm. film toes this line between documentary and fiction. And, and these questions of what's a lie and what's real and, um, and is any of this real and is, and is possibly all this is a lie. And this comes up often as a question within documentary filmmaking. Um, and of course, um, comes up uh, constantly as far as specifically writers and Edgar stories. Um, what's the reality of it? Um, I, I would love to pass this on to you to see where you con how you conceived of that and how that kind of led you throughout the whole process. And yeah. if, you have, if you have an answer for the end, if you, is our Edgar stories actually uh, truth or, or a lie <laughs> or somewhere in between? Yeah, so before we were uh, going to film, we, we wondered ourselves this question, or we, we, we wondered, is, is this story about his parents met, is it true? It's, it's too good to be true, it can't be. It, not all his stories can be, can be exactly like he, tells them because they sound like a fairy tale um, but in the end while while filming we uh, we yeah well we came to the conclusion that it didn't I think for uh, Edgar it doesn't really matter uh, and uh, like telling stories is a give well he, he says it himself it, it's like uh, giving giving meaning to your life so it's 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 uh, quite existential to uh, to to do and so it doesn't really matter if it's true or not but you did get to meet Kobe and Uzi that, you know, if I would have just told you about Kobe and Uzi, you wouldn't have believed me. You, say, you would say he made them up. True. Yeah. True. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's also the fact that like the weirdest stories were true and the, the ones that were not, not really so weird, <laughs> they, they, were, they were actually uh, made up. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, I, I, yeah, but there. There are, there are, like, there are, different kinds of lies. I think Edgar said this once as well. I mean, you have negative lies, like your president tells all the time, and, uh, and you have positive ones who can make life more uh, cheerful or, or give you insights even. And uh, um, yeah, they get to the truth somehow. It's just lies to tell the truth. It was one of the titles that we, uh, uh, you know, considered. Uh, and I think your brother tells it uh, perfectly when he says, uh, Edgar, uh, uh, yeah. He, he tells lies to, 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 to get to the truth even further. Yeah. yeah, because the truth is sometimes a bit boring. So you can better yeah. make a good story out of it. So people will understand it better. No, I, I, I think that the truth is never boring. I think that the moment that the truth gets too boring, there is something kind of hidden in it. Because I think that you can experience anything on uh, many levels. And, uh, and that many times when you write a story, you try to, I don't know, you can exaggerate something or uh, you can uh, create something that is a little bit more dramatic, but what you're doing basically is you're trying to take out the, the, this one thing that was genuine in this story or situation and kind of put it in front of the light. You know, it's more kind of a question of uh, focusing on something than making up something. 
Um, I, I want to give us a, t a little bit of a test in, in some ways. I just read um, last night, I'm, I'm sharing it here actually with everybody um, in the chat. And by the way, folks, this is going to be my last official question unless, uh, and I'm going to open it to, to your questions right after this. If you want to ask a question, you could type it into the chat and we'll unmute you to ask. And um, if you also just want to raise your hand, we could try to look for you. You could do it virtually through the participants tab. Um, you could raise your hand there. Um, but um, last night I read Olives at the End of the World, which is a really, really short story that you wrote for um, this, pa this pandemic um, that was published in uh, NewYorkBooks.com. Um, again, the link for anybody who wants to check it out is um, in the chat box. Um, how close was that to truth? And can you tell us a little bit for the audience that hasn't read it? Tell us a little bit about that story. Yeah, oh, yeah. First of all, I want to say is that nothing in it is true. You know, I mean, it's it's a fiction story, but but it's a story about uh, somebody who goes to a supermarket and it says like the day in which the world is about to end, and everything was taken from that supermarket. Uh, he was planning to make himself a pizza or something, but you know, but. Uh, he understands that he that he'll have to kind of find find whatever he, he can take, and he finds a a jar of olives. And as he comes to pay the the cashier, who's really really hysterical and in, in tears because she understands that she will never see her grandchildren again, because they're all gonna die. Uh, she refuses to take money from him because she says, "What's the point in money? You know, the world is gonna end in a few hours. What what am I gonna do with your money?" And in the end, it gives him the olives in exchange for a hug. And uh, and I think, you know, I think that about the coronavirus phenomena, I, I wrote many, many texts because I think that it kind of it puts into light many things. But I think that one of the things when you would see people, I don't know, fighting over toilet paper, you understood that in, in the bottom line, this kind of security that money gives us, it's a... Uh, it's totally false. In the end, we don't need money. We need something to eat and we need sometimes a hug. I love that. I love that. That ultimately, I think, even not in a pandemic, sometimes when things are tense, uh, you know, you, that, that's, that's all that people need. Yeah. Um, I'd love to see if there are any questions from the audience. If anybody has some questions, maybe this is, this is your opportunity. Um, Edgar, I also want to thank you for joining us. I hear it's uh, Shira, who's also in the films. It's Shira's birthday today. Yeah, yeah it is. It Shira. is. It is. And, and my apologies for forgetting. It was all this kind of birthday excitement. I guess it got me, of course. How do you celebrate um, when uh, when in lockdown? Well, it's funny because Shira asked me as a birthday present to write to her her a story. So I was kind of busy writing a story and uh, it's kind of, I gave her, the it's a first draft and she had remarks, you know, but uh, but she was happy, I think. Um, it's, it's a nice gift, very, ch very cheap, good. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's funny because I usually, we actually have these things that uh, around her birthday that uh, I, me and Lev, we always prepare things because she really likes it. And this year she said, you know what? I just want you to write me a story. And I said, okay, great. Nice. Um, we have a question from Marlene Nichols. Marlene, we're gonna unmute your mic and uh, you can ask your question. Go for Marlene. Hi, Edgar and Steven and Rutger. Like, bravo on the film. And I especially love this one scene in the cop car when the police officer who's taking Edgar as he's talking about the family sort of shoves him in the face and he kind of lives like, oh, oh, this is real. Okay, I guess I keep going. Um, so I too was, I was sort of raised in the South by um, a woman who was a child during the war. And so it was a very kind of Tennessee Williams meets the brother Grimm kind of upbringing. And it had this bit of like, well, there's a morality tale, but exaggeration, I mean, don't make it boring, make it a little more interesting. <laughs> and I'm in Los Angeles and I, we've been in quote unquote lockdown since the seventh, since St. Patrick's Day, basically. And so it's been interesting. Sometimes the stories come and sometimes they don't in this like now several weeks. So I'm wondering like within your space, what are the kind because we can't kind of go out into the world and have things happen to us in that way 
but we have a different way that things happen to us now. And so where are the inspiration or where are these little things that are coming into your head? Is it from internal? Is it from your family? Or is it just from the birds yeah. outside? Well, I think that whenever you write a story, then what you try to to touch some kind of authenticity and this authenticity often comes when the force of inertia is broken because mm. like in an average day you know you wake up in the morning and you go to work and you pick up i don't know a cousin a, a nephew from school and then you do this and you do that but you're very passive you don't make choices you don't ask yourself who you are what do you want to do and actually there is something in this kind of very arbitrary situation that it's painful and it's difficult and it's stressful, but at the same time, it's also very authentic, you know? So, so, so in different angles, uh, it touches so many, so many things that, uh, that are relevant for our life. You know, our relationships, uh, uh, I think some people, you find it wonderful to spend more time in the family. Some people find it pure hell, you know? <laughs> I think some kind of a, a, a question about, what would you do if you could do anything? Because many people who wake up in the morning, they can do whatever they want. You know, they can learn uh, Russian or Chinese or, I don't know, start a body, bodybuilding. You know, they can do whatever they want. But I think that it, many times it puts you in this position where you understand that you really don't know what you want, you know. So I, I actually felt very inspired in this period, very much both by the things that I saw, but also... Uh, through the experiences that I had, you know, like w w the last experience I wrote about was this idea that, you know, here they begin to lift, uh, lift the lockdown from a Sunday. They begin to lift the lockdown. And there is a side of me that is very, uh, that is a bit scared of that because I got really used to walking in quiet street. Nobody's there. Nobody gets too close. Nobody talks loud. Hardly any cars, you know, and like, of course, I'm happy that everything is going back to normal, but, but I'm not sure that I'm remembering exactly how to do it correctly, you know, so, <laughs> so there are so many things that, you know, these kind of ideas that when, when people shake you, you know, you, you start seeing things around you and they, and, say, and for me, it's also kind of a, there is a comforting factor in it because Everything around you is so difficult, but when you write, you say, well, actually, maybe I can make something out of this difficulty or this stress or this pain. We have, we have can another I, can question. I add, yes. add one thing, Isaac? Yeah, the, about the slapping in the face uh, in the scene. Uh, uh, this was actually one of the things that Edgar uh, suggested himself. And uh, it took uh, like a couple of takes and he said, slap me harder. Slap me harder. <laughs> yeah, purely for artistic reasons. No, the, the truth is that there was something. There was something about it that it was like a, it. It didn't feel enough of a scene, you know. I wanted to have something moving in it, and I, and also I, I had it coming. <laughs> I, I think there was some Hamlet in there after all. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we have Lisa with a question. Lisa, we've unmuted you. Hi. Hi, Edgar. Um, I had the privilege of hearing you tell a story at the Brotherhood Synagogue. Um, do you remember? And I was wondering if you could give us a little treat to maybe read a little of, from one of your stories, because it was so delightful. And hey. my, um, my second part of my question is, um, you know, we've seen all of these uh, TV shows now have, who have cut, that have come here from Israel. And the newest one, I guess, is The Baker and the Beauty. And I was curious if you had seen it and what you were thinking about the story. Uh, I, I, di I didn't see it. I'm sorry. It's like, uh, I think that, that for me, the past year or so was a little bit kind of a, I'm, my mother had died and we were working overseas. So... I was a little bit out and know very little about contemporary things. Like there were a couple of beautiful uh, series that I saw, like Our Boys, you know, in HBO. But uh, I've, I've missed out on a lot. I still have a lot of catching up to do. 
Um, Edgar, I will though connect your question to a question about TV. You just completed a um, French TV series. I actually got to see it. Um, I thought it was um, fantastic. Um, oh, and, and also you, you did it with Shira and um, I think has, has the spirit and tone of, uh, of both of your works. And, um, and where do you, do you know the plans with that? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, well, it's going to uh, be broadcast on Arte. It's like a French, German, I don't know, Swiss channel. Uh, 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 next, next Friday on the 7th of May. And uh, uh, we were supposed to come to New York uh, in, a, uh, in a couple of weeks, I think, uh, to show it in, the, uh, in Symphony Space in the Upper West Side. Uh, but of course we can't come and uh, the screening was canceled and they, I don't know, like the truth is that it doesn't have a broadcaster in the US or in Israel yet, but uh, I hope it will find one. It was, for me, it was the, the most uh, demanding and exciting project I took part in in my life. You know, it's me and Shira going to France, working with a, 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 an actor genius like Mathieu Amalric and the, uh, directing in a language we don't speak, you know, it was totally, totally extreme, and and we've learned a lot from it. And I, I really think that I, for me, it's the first time that uh, that uh, the the uh, the sensibility of my stories is kind of brought to the screen. I think I think that Rodger and Stefan did it in the documentary kind of branch, but this was kind of an attempt to bring it uh, to fiction. Um. Felicia, you're you're up next with a question. Felicia, can I can I just say that this is so nice, guys? It feels like we're in a we're in a we're in a movie theater. I can smell the popcorn, <laughs> and I can smell Edgar, which is always yeah nice and also a little <laughs> bit weird. But yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I smell stronger than popcorn. <laughs> yeah, I, I love while while we're talking, I keep flipping through the speaker view just to see people and. Uh, Get reminded that there are other human beings out there. It's really nice. <laughs> um, Felicia, you had a question? Yes. Shalom, everyone. This is Shalom. wonderful and uh, great to um, participate in. Um, wait, I think I have to go to gallery view to see everyone, right? Yeah. So I hope that we can end with a reading um, by Edgar, but I was wanting to ask, um, I'm also the child of a, one Holocaust survivor, and I um, listened attentively as you shared your story of your parents and how they told you stories that they made up, um, which was both uh, funny and enlightening. I was wondering how um, the, their Holocaust experience informs your work uh, today. Well, you know, I think that as I spoke before about this uh, a, a force of inertia that only when it's broken, you can reach a place that is authentic. And I think that, that uh, there was something about my parents that, uh, you know, being orphaned in a young age, taking care of themselves, uh, uh, living in a world where they had no grown-ups uh, responsible for them, it kind of made them invent the life around them. They would make their own rules. You know, it's, it's like, a, a, I, like I say in the movie, you know, that my mom would say, if it rains, you don't go to school, you know? So, so I think being raised in, in, in a, a environment of people who make their own rules and get away with it and seem to be very, very happy with this result. And the, it's, there is something very empowering about it. It's this kind of idea that when they say to, to you, go out to life, they don't say like, do what you're supposed to do, but they say, you know, do whatever you feel like and you'll be able to pull it off. And for me, it's like, you know, it's, it's much more motivating to see, you know, a, a father or, a, who gets up one day and says, you know what, I'm, I don't like my job. I'm going to close it down and do something totally different that I don't know anything about. And being able to do it and, and, kind of get away with it, it, it gives you this, uh, this uh, feeling and sensation that if you do 
anything less than that, then you'll be uh, abusing life. You'll be kind of misusing this presence that was given to you. Um, Edgar, speaking of, uh, of your parents and also connects to this question of fiction versus nonfiction, um, you wrote, of course, um, a fabulous book about your father, The Seven Good Years, um, or about a period of the connection with your father. Um, and and that's, that's a memoir, as, as it's titled. And, um, and I'm wondering how that experience was different than writing your short stories, um, both as far as that being, I'd say, to some extent, um, completely nonfiction, while your short stories might be com considered completely fiction. Well, I think I think that the, that when I write the, a story, the, the the my greatest motivation to write it is to kind of discover that story. Like I don't know what the story is going to be. I want to figure out what's going to happen. You know, I want to discover. I, I want to kind of read that story, so I, I have to write it for it to to exist. And and I think with nonfiction, you don't have that because you know what's going to happen. You know, if I tell a story about my dad's funeral, then I know what's going to happen in the end, you know. And uh, I think that this is the thing that always kind of made me see a memoir writing as something that is totally not sexy, you know. It's like you, tell, you, tell, you write down a story that you already know. Uh, if the story is great, you have no credit for it because it has nothing to do with your imagination, you know. It's whoever tells your story in life that you get the credit. So I, I kind of, I, I, it was something that I didn't even want to try. And, and I think that in those seven years uh, uh, between the, the, the birth of my son or, or our son and, and the death of my father, there was some kind of need to document things because suddenly when I was a father, <clears throat> I wanted to, to share things with my son. You know, I wanted to tell him uh, how much I love uh, his granddad. I wanted to talk to him about the difficulties that I had. I wanted to kind of, uh, I had this incentive to tell this history of our little family. And, uh, and it was a strange experience because I did discover that in the end that when you write down those stories, you, uh, it's not as if you write something that you totally know because you know what happened, but when you write a story, your emphasis is what you choose to tell more and what you kind of tend to to uh, brush aside. They tell you in the end how how you kind of emotionally remembered it, and it's a little bit like I don't know, like uh, hypnosis or going to therapy or all these other things that kind of make you understand some, more about yourself. Um, we're going to take, I think, one last question from Julie. Julie, you're up. That your parents never married? <laughs> or did I hear something wrong? Oh, no, no, no. My parents, they did, did, did get married. Uh, they did? With a okay. rabbi. I, that was in the sea of the Canaret, yeah. Okay, I'm glad. I'm uh -huh. a kosher, kosher child. I'm not a bastard. Good. Like I am a bastard <laughs> in the heart. But it would but make I, a good story. I, I, I thought I heard that in the movie, but I'm going to watch it again this afternoon. <laughs> oh, thanks. You have till 7 p.m. It will forever disappear. Um, Stefan and Rutger, maybe you could tell us a little bit about what else you've been working on and how else people can get, because they're going to want to tell their friends about this film. How else, what, where else can they find out information about the film? Um, yeah, well, that's, uh, that's a bit tricky, um, <laughs> like information. There's a lot of information. Please give us a rating on IMDB, by the way, we appreciate that. Um, but, um, yeah, it hasn't been sold to, uh, to an American network yet and not to a Netflix or, or something like that. So we hope we can, uh, do that in the near future. So everyone in the world can see it. Yeah. We have some uh, obligations towards the Dutch uh, television, uh, rules uh, but uh, I think end of 2000 uh, end of next year it's it's free and we're gonna we're gonna put it somewhere on uh, YouTube or Vimeo or something so uh, then everybody can watch it freely uh, I also wanted to uh, uh, let know that uh, somewhere in the audience we have uh, Jotte and uh, she she helped a great deal 
so I wanted to say thank you again. Uh, hey, Jota. <laughs> She is. Yeah. She's, she's there. yeah. She played uh, the stewardess in the, in the in the airport scene. Was was, was very important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what else have you guys been working on since this? Or what's next for you? Yeah, I, I did a I did a big uh, a big TV series about scientists. Uh, it's called Big Questions, and I have to say that scientists are worse actors than Edgar is. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I write mostly non-fiction and autobiographical uh, essays, so I'm a bit insulted by everything that Edgar said, but uh, I'll, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll, I'll hang in there. Um, well, Edgar, I, I, yeah, no, I think this is the story of our life, Rodger, you know, that all the time I do think that, uh, that like, I, I, I think that's what's interesting. I think that I, I never had, knew anybody uh, that I enjoyed arguing more with than with you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm saying it as a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, Edgar, what, uh, what is the name of the TV series, uh, the French TV series, and uh, what else are you working on? So in French, it's called La Jeanne Immobilier, and in English, it's called The Middleman. And uh, I've been, uh, well, I, I've published a book this year uh, in the US. Yeah, it was, the, no, last year, a uh, flyer already. And uh, I'm uh, working on another TV series uh, that is a, a supernatural detective that I work with uh, Hamutal, uh, who, who was also briefly in this film, in the end, in the, in the dinner scene. Uh, and I don't really remember what I do. I, I kind of I write stuff. I, I still don't know what I'm going to do with the stuff that I write. Um, I want to thank the three of you for giving us this opportunity to get together, for being here with us. Um, I want everybody, please, to stay safe um, and um, connect via Zoom, but not in other ways. We're going to have this, uh, this conversation. We'll, um, we're going to put on our... Um, YouTube channel. Also, our May films um, for the JCC film program are already up online. You can go to jccfilm.org um, or here on the side of the screen, Morgan has put up uh, Eventbrite, um, uh, the, the link to the Eventbrite tickets. Um, and we'll be doing a lot more of these um, throughout the season. And as I mentioned at the beginning, in June, June 7th to the 14th, we're going to be hosting our Israel Film Center Festival. And there'll be plenty of wonderful Israeli films coming out that uh, we'll be sharing with our community. So thank you all for joining us. Um, we'll have a Q&A with Jesse Eisenberg, by the way, on May 13th. And um, a film, uh, Those Who Remain, um, um, coming up next week. We look forward to seeing you there. Help us spread the word. And have a good day, everyone. Take care. Good night.